mission and it's likely one of us will be killed the landing party will consist of myself mr spark dr mccoy and ensign ricky oh, crap hello everybody this is ensign ricky and welcome to my video series where i will be breaking down our most favorite sci-fi franchises episode by episode the episode i will be breaking down in today's video is from the star trek franchise today i will be reviewing and discussing star trek's second breakout series star trek the next generation otherwise known as TNG. If you would like more information about the backstory and characters of the next generation, please check out my previous video that introduces the series. So with that all said, let's dive into Star Trek The Next Generation's first aired episode, The Encounter at Farpoint. Air, air date, date and, and episode, episode number. number. This is the first aired episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Even though the initial reception of this episode wasn't great amongst fans and critics, The Next Generation would start a second golden age for the franchise and carry the franchise torch for another 18 years to come. This episode aired on September 28, 1987, which puts it a little over 20 years from the debut of Star Trek's original series. So our first adventure with the crew of The Next Generation aboard the new Galaxy-class Enterprise-D begins on September 28, 1987. Directors, directors, writers, writers and, special and special guest, guest actors. actors. This episode is directed by Corey Allen. Corey Allen is an American director, actor, writer, and producer. His career spanned over 60 years and he has directed and acted in roles in television, the movies, and on stage. Allen began his career as an actor and eventually became a full-fledged director. Including this episode of Star Trek, Ellen will go on to direct four more episodes for The Next Generation, as well as four episodes for Deep Space Nine. Ellen has been part of projects such as Dallas, Hawaii Five-0, Hill Street Blues, Magnum P.I., Simon and & Simon, and The Rockford Files. The story of this episode was written by Dorothy D.C. Fontana and Gene Roddenberry himself. Fontana was put under enormous pressure to write this episode and drafted most of the story herself. But due to Gene Roddenberry's unusual and sometimes underhanded script rewriting tactics, he received a writing credit for this episode. Fontana would go on to get a Hugo nomination for this episode. Dorothy D.C. Fontana is an American writer, producer, and story editor. Her career spent almost 50 years. Fontana is a Star Trek veteran and one of the very few people who have worked on almost every Star Trek series. Fontana, along with Robert Justman and a few others that worked on Star Trek's original series, would eventually get pulled back into Star Trek to work on The Next Generation. Fontana has 10 episodes of Star Trek's original series under her belt, as well as 4 more episodes besides this one for Star Trek The Next Generation. She also wrote an episode of Star Trek's animated series, and one episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Needless to say, this woman is a Star Trek hero of some serious note, and I will get more into this later. Fontana has worked on projects such as Babylon 5, Buck Rogers, The Six Million Dollar Man, Bonanza, Dallas, and Transformers Beast Wars. We have two guest actors in this episode and one very special guest appearance. For our first guest actor, we have John DeLancey, who plays the mysterious Q entity. Gene Roddenberry invented the Q character, and at the time, the other members of the production staff hated it because this was just a remake of Trelane from the original series episode, The Squire of Gothos. Despite the complaints with the crew, Gene still went ahead with it. I will do some personal comparisons between Q and Trelane later on. Delancey is an American actor, comedian, director, writer, producer, musician, and singer. His career spans almost 50 years, and he has directed and acted in roles on television, the movies, on the stage, and also in voice acting. Delancey would go on to be a series fan favorite, 
and he will continue to appear as Q 11 more times throughout the Star Trek franchise. Delancey has worked on projects such as Crank, High Voltage, Breaking Bad, Stargate SG-1, Torchwood, The Outer Limits, and Invader Zim. For our second guest actor, we have Michael Bell, who plays Zorn. Zorn is the grappler, or leader, of the bandy people at Farpoint Station. Michael Bell is an American actor, director, and activist. His career spans over 60 years, and he has directed and acted in roles in television and in animation. His voice acting career is quite vast, and he has worked in over 100 different cartoons and animated movies. Bell will make two more guest appearances in Star Trek Deep Space Nine's second season, in the episodes The Homecoming as Borum, and in The Marquis Part Two as Drofo Awa. Bell has worked on such projects as Charlie's Angels, Hunter, MASH, The Transformers, G.I. Joe, Star Wars Rebels, The Smurfs, and Voltron. For our special guest appearance, we get none other than DeForce Kelly, who reprises his role as the legendary Leonard Bones McCoy. Before his part, Kelly expressed the similar skepticism about the new Star Trek series shared by both critics and fans at the time. But when the time came, Kelly was eager to play the part. This would be Kelly's last major film or screen appearance for the rest of his life. DeForest Kelly was an American actor, writer, poet, singer, and retired Air Force veteran. His career would span over 50 years and he acted in roles in television, the movies, the radio, and also in voice acting. Kelly may be perhaps most famous for his portrayal of Leonard McCoy in the original Star Trek series, but he acted in quite a few Western films as well. Kelly has appeared in 75 Star Trek original series episodes, 19 episodes of Star Trek the Animated Series, and 7 Star Trek films. Kelly has worked on projects such as The Lone Ranger, Have Gun, Will Travel, Bonanza, You Are There, and Death Valley Days. IMDB and Personal Synopsis Okay, now let's get into the synopsis for this episode. The IMDB synopsis says, On the maiden mission of the USS Enterprise D, an omnipotent being known as Q challenges the crew to discover the secret of a mysterious base in an advanced and civilized fashion. This is pretty accurate and pretty much gives away the whole story. In some cases, the IMDB synopsis has a little mystery to it, but definitely not here. However, my personal synopsis is the one where Natasha Yar gets frozen in carbonite. Story, story breakdown, breakdown and galactic, galactic map, map position. position. The story itself is broken down into 10 acts and takes place on the planet Deneb 4 on Stardate 41153.7. Now, Stardate 41153.7, after some research, calculates out to the February in the year 2364. As they go on to explain in the story, Deneb 4 is on the edge of known space, and clearly on the map, we can see this. The Federation is sending the Enterprise and crew to negotiate with the inhabitants of Farpoint Station. They plan on using the station as an outpost to further explore the galaxy. But this is not the first time we visit the Deneb system in Star Trek. In Star Trek's original series, Kirk and crew visit and orbit Deneb 4 in the episode Where No Man Has Gone Before on Stardate 1312.4 in the year 2265. And now on to our story. Captain's Log. Captain's Log, Stardate 41153.7. Our destination is planet Deneb 4, beyond which lies the great unexplored mass of the galaxy. My orders are to examine Farpoint, a starbase built there by the inhabitants of that world. Meanwhile, I am becoming better acquainted with my new command, this galaxy-class USS Enterprise. I am still somewhat in awe of its size and complexity. As for my crew, we are short in several key positions, most notably a first officer, but I am informed that a highly experienced man, one Commander William Riker, We'll be waiting to join the ship at our Deneb 4 destination. Act, Act one. 1. 
Okay, so our story starts off with a nice intro, and then we get our first ever stock shot of our new Enterprise D. Then we zoom through a window, and we get a small introduction scene to meet our new captain, Jean-Luc Picard. I never quite understood the beginning shot of Jean-Luc here. The reason why is that I'm assuming he's in his quarters with the lights off for some odd reason. Then there's backlight coming from a window behind him. How small are his quarters? Just a thought. Picard, still in the middle of some inner monologue, starts heading for the bridge. He goes on to explain that he's en route to Deadnab 4 to examine Farpoint Station and meet the inhabitants. Then we get our first shot of the Enterprise D's engine room as Picard strolls through and makes his way up to the bridge. Picard steps off the turbo lift. Then we get our first shot of the Enterprise D's very massive and spacious bridge. He continues to explain that he is taken in by the sheer size and complexity of this new vessel. And they are still short crew members in some key areas. He mentions the need for a first officer and states that when they get to Deneb 4, a highly experienced officer named William Riker will join the crew. Picard then walks over and talks to the crew. Among them is Data, an android, and Deanna Troy, who is the ship's counselor. After some small talk with Data and exploring the definition of the word Snoop, Counselor Troy, using her powers gifted by her Beta Z heritage, senses a powerful mind approaching. Then Helmsman Torres picks up a disturbance on the ship's scanners as the Enterprise's alarm starts to sound. On the view screen, we see what almost looks like a net forming around the ship. In my opinion, it looks similar to the web field employed by the Tholians in the original series episode, The Tholian Web. Data begins to report that the object registers as a solid, and Troy mentions that it could be a powerful force field. Ricard, taking no chances, stands, and then orders the ship to go to yellow alert. Which brings us to our first clip. Now when a captain orders the crew to go to yellow alert, the crew responds by raising the ship's shields and being more alert if something does happen. It registers a solid, Captain. Or an incredibly powerful force field. But if we collide with either, it could be very- Shut off that damn noise! Go to yellow alert! Shields and deflectors up, sir. In this scene, Picard issues the order, and it literally takes Natasha and Worf in the back a whopping 11 seconds to raise the shield. In a space battle, a ship without a shield is just a sitting duck. It's pretty much just a torpedo or two from complete destruction. This could happen in a span of a couple seconds. But 11 seconds? That ship is pretty much done for. But remember this scene for later. So, the Enterprise shields finally go up and the crew is on high alert. The card watches as the ship gets closer to the web and orders the ship to reverse power and come to a full stop. The Enterprise comes to a full stop just short of the web barrier. Then from behind Picard, we get a burst of light and then we get our first shot of an alien as it teleports onto the bridge to meet Picard for the first time. The crew jumps into action as soon as the alien speaks. The alien, dressed as a Spanish Armada captain, goes on to say that the humans have went too far into the galaxy and that they are immediately to return to their own solar system. Picard, not ready to stand down, claims that the alien is making quite a demand and asks the alien who or what it is. This is where I start drawing comparisons to Trelane from the original series episode, The Squire of Gothos. When Kirk and crew first confront Trelane for the first time, he takes the form of a soldier from one of Earth's distant time periods because he's receiving messages from Earth a thousand years in the past. Q enters TNG very much the same way. We will have more comparisons later on. The alien then introduces its race as the Q, and goes on to explain he took his current form for the humans to better understand him. He's speaking in an old English dialect. Two crew members try to get off the turbo lift and Q bars the entrance. He then walks down to Picard to address him. Then Helmsman Torres from behind tries to get the drop on Q and slowly starts sneaking out a phaser. Q instantly turns around and literally freezes him solid. The crew instantly goes down to help the frozen Torres, and Picard orders Data to call sickbay. Picard then pries the phaser from Torres' frozen hands. Picard then turns around and shows Q the phaser and goes on to mention that it would not have harmed him because the phaser was set to stun. In Q's defense, if someone was going to attack you from behind and you knew about it, stun or not, I'm sure most people would retaliate in the same manner. Perhaps this also opens up the possibility that the Q are susceptible to phaser fire. Q then says to Picard, Knowing humans as thou dost, Captain, wouldst thou be captured helpless by them? 
He then says, Now go back, or thou shalt most certainly die. Act 2 So, we see the Enterprise is still held fast by Q's web. Strangely, we get a small supplemental captain's log saying that Torres and Sickbay is going to recover. While in the middle of talking to Q on the bridge, how he pulls this off, I don't know. Q goes on to explain that human sentries go by so rapidly, and then he tries to better suit himself to the situation and turns into a 20th century Marine Corps captain. Q then changes up the story a little bit and then uses Patrium as a vehicle to turn the humans back to home to take care of the communist threat. He goes on to say it only takes a few good men. If this is a reference to the movie of the same title, I don't know. Q is accusing humanity of being a grievously savage race. Picard, definitely not amused by the whole situation, goes on to defend the human race. He agrees that when humans wore costumes like that 400 years ago, they were indeed a savage race. This is what eludes me. Picard is also an officer, and he addresses the uniform that Q is wearing as a costume. You would think that he would have more respect than that just to call it a costume. Just saying. Q goes on to explain the savagery of the human race and all its bloody accomplishments. Picard retorts that even when humans wore costumes like that, the race was already improving. Q then turns into a 21st century officer and goes to explain that humans learn to control their militaries through drugs. Every so often after this, we get a scene with a soldier taking the drug, which is attached to their uniform. Worf then gets a message from Sickbay, and they report that Torres' condition is vastly improving. Worf then asks for permission to clean up the bridge. Natasha Yar firmly agrees with Worf, and steps in and asks Picard for permission to take care of Q. Picard ultimately tells her to stand down. Q and Picard debate back and forth. Q then continues to heap all sorts of dirt on the human race, going on to say that when humans reach deep space, the murdering and war didn't stop. He continues to say the story just repeats itself over and over and over. Picard, still not amused, replies that the same old story is beating self-righteous beings who are not here to learn, but to prosecute and judge things they can't tolerate or understand. Q then says they know humans all too well, and that judging and prosecuting is an interesting idea. Q then tells Picard that the next time they meet, they will proceed just as Picard suggests. And then Q disappears. With Q now gone, Worf then suggests that the crew stand and fight him, while on the other hand, Natasha Yar suggests that they all escape. Which brings me to Worf, and oh, don't worry, I will have a lot to say about Worf as we continue on down the road. In earlier seasons of TNG, Worf's usual response to threats is, uh, shoot and kill it which leads to some pretty funny moments later on. I might even track a few things on Worf alone. Another interesting note here about Worf is not Worf himself, but a piece of his costume. Worf is wearing what they refer to as a baldric. He wears this baldric across his chest throughout his complete tenure in the Star Trek franchise. This is to show the pride that he has for his Klingon heritage. But this particular baldric he's wearing and the one he continues to wear out through the whole first season, is the very same baldric that was worn by the Klingons in the original series. The actual symbol on the band is removable, and usually changed from Klingon to Klingon. You can see it pictured here on Michael and Sarah's King from the original series episode, Day of the Dove, and on John Calico's Core from the episode, Errant of Mercy. In season two, Worf would be made a new baldric by the production team. So, Picard asks Troy for advice, and she suggests that Q's mind is too powerful and they avoid contact altogether. Picard then orders the crew to not transmit any radio signals and prepare for maximum acceleration. Picard plans to take Q by surprise and quotes, Let's see what this galaxy-class starship can do. Picard then asks Data to search the records for saucer separation at warp speed. Data replies, inadvisable at any warp speed. Picard then asks Data to search theoretical. Data, of course, responds yes, but with absolutely no margin for error. Picard then turns around and explains the danger of warp speed to everyone, as if they're all cadets at the Academy. Now, we all know that only the best and brightest Starfleet has to offer is on this ship. Because if they had made it this far in Starfleet as to be posted on one of their flagships, I'd seriously hope they would know the dangers of warp speed. And then we get another short scene of Worf going down through the engine room and getting a status for Picard. 
He eventually returns to the bridge and gives Picard the report. The crew then braces for warp speed and we get our very first engage. The Enterprise turns around, fires up its engines, and takes off. Right behind it, the force field collapses into a shining ball of light and begins to chase the Enterprise. Back on the bridge, we get a shot of the view screen with Worf and Data at the helm. This shot right here I have seen in so many memes it's ridiculous. The Enterprise continues to push its engines to warp speed. Yar informs them that Q is chasing them and increasing speed. Picard turns to Troy and asks what they have just encountered. Troy explains that it is something beyond what they consider a life form. Yar then says the hostile is overtaking the Enterprise in speed. Picard asks to put it on the view screen. She continues to say the hostile has reached warp 9.7. Picard asks for more power from engineering, but Data replies there is no more. Then Picard issues another yellow alert? I mean, did they ever really stand down from the first one? Picard tells the crew to arm torpedoes and stand by. The hostile has reached warp 9.7, but the Enterprise is only going warp 9.5. Data informs Picard that they could match the hostile speed, but only at extreme risk. Yar now reports the hostiles going warp 9.9. .9. Picard orders the crew to prepare for an emergency saucer separation. And then we get all these intense stares from the crew like he just told them to prepare for emergency ship detonation instead. Picard orders Worf to take command of the saucer section. But Worf protests. He says that he's a Klingon, and he cannot leave his captain's side in the midst of battle. But Picard shuts him right down as we get our first crew reprimand by Picard. Worf then accepts the order. The crew begins to switch out as Picard makes a note in the ship's log that he is transferring all commands to the rarely seen battle bridge. Picard, Data, Troy, and Yar all step in the turbo lift and head off. Act 3. So, we start off with a scene of everybody evacuating to the saucer section. Picard and crew make it to the Battle Bridge. And while we're on the topic of the Battle Bridge, this is only one of three episodes we see the Battle Bridge. In all these episodes, we also get to see a Saucer Separation. We will get to see both Battle Bridge and Saucer Separation again in TNG's The Arsenal of Freedom and The Best of Both Worlds Part 2. On the Battle Bridge, Picard tells Yar to get the torpedoes ready to fire at Q. He intends to blind Q so the saucer section can escape. And then we get our very first shot of my favorite engineer, Chief Miles O'Brien, who I will go into more in my next video when I review Deep Space Nine's Emissary. Picard contacts Worf and tells him the plan. Picard fires the torpedoes and gives the order to separate. And then we cut to an edited version of the title theme, and we get to see the Enterprise separate. Now, let's go back to the production notes for a second and explain why this separation sequence is put in. This was an idea that Gene Roddenberry and crew wanted to do in Star Trek's original series. Supposedly, the original Enterprise was built with the intention of having saucer separation, but unfortunately it was too much money for production at the time. Gene Roddenberry fought with the studio to only do an hour-long episode for the premiere. The studio said no and they finally decided and settled on a two-hour premiere. Beforehand, Gene asked Dorothy Fontana to write this script. Fontana agreed, but he only told her to write 90 minutes of material because the final time it was not yet decided. So in only a month, Fontana wrote the script, but only had a 90 minute script. So this sequence along with the Q entity got added to fill the remaining time. Some of the shots of Data's face in the separation and connection sequences are priceless. With the separation complete, Picard orders a full stop. He intends to wait for Q's vessel. Yar insists they fight it. Picard asks her seriously if she intends to fight a being that's capable of all those things. He then politely asks for her advice. She replies that maybe she had spoken too soon and maybe they should do their best to distract Q from the saucer section. As the Q vessel approaches, Picard gives the order to surrender. The ship is then surrounded again by a force field and we get transported to a 21st century courtroom. The crew in suspense looks around the room at the people in the stands. Data says he's intrigued by the accuracy of the courtroom. And Picard replies, mid 21st century, also known as the post-atomic horror. Troy mentions to the crew that be careful, that this is very real, and this is not an illusion. 
and then with an overdramatic entrance and a floating throne. Q, who is addressed as the judge, enters and hovers towards the crew. Which brings me to my second Trelane and Q comparison. Kirk gets judged in the very same fashion by Trelane as Q does here to Picard and crew. Just throwing that out there. Q's dramatic entrance comes to a stop. A guard comes over firing his gun in the air and asks for the crew to stand at attention. Yar at this point has had enough and attacks the guard and takes him right out. Q then yells at the guard and tells him he's out of order and then has him executed. Q announces the prisoners will not be harmed and he asks his guards to dispose of the other guard. Q has his presenters charge all humanity with being a grievously savage race. Data intervenes to try to drop some knowledge on Q, but Q shuts him down. Yar then stands up because she's had enough and berates Q in his court. He promptly freezes her in carbonite. With Yar now frozen, Picard turns to Q and tells him to keep his promise that the prisoners will not be harmed. Q and Picard debate about the trial for a bit. Q then thaws out Yar and says that this is a merciful court, but the crowd disapproves. Q then charges Picard and crew for being of savage race and goes as far as to force Picard into a guilty plea. Q then has his guards aim their guns at the rest of the crew. He asks them to fire if Picard answers with anything but guilty. Act, Act four. 4 Picard, now in a tough position, has no choice, so he pleads guilty. Picard looks back at Data to replay a statement made by Q saying the prisoners would not be harmed. Q, however, is uninterested. Picard then does agree that at one time humans were a savage race, but that is not presently true of them now. Picard then proposes a test. Q agrees and goes on to say that their current mission to Farpoint Station would be a perfect test. With that, Q departs with a few demeaning words and the crew gets teleported back to the Enterprise. The crew, now back on the Enterprise, make way to Farpoint Station. And then we get a shot of Deneb 4 in all its glory, and a small personal log from Commander William Riker who had just arrived to the planet off the USS Hood. He is to wait to join the Enterprise, which is en route. Riker is on his way to see the Grappler, or leader of Farpoint Station. He makes it to Zorn's chamber. Zorn asks if the accommodations have been good. Riker then agrees, and then he talks about how fascinating the station is and how perfectly suited it is to their needs. After a little more small talk, Zorn offers some earth fruit to Riker. Riker looks down and mentions that if he had apples, then absolutely, but he does not see any apples. He looks back up to speak to Zorn. Then he glances back down really quick, and to his astonishment, he sees a bowl full of apples. He questions Zorn about it, but then Zorn deflects his question. After a little more back and forth, Riker finally departs with an apple in his hand. With Riker now gone, Zorn scorns seemingly no one and makes threats out in the open air. He goes on to tell whatever it is he's talking to to stop arousing suspicion and that they would be punished if they continue to do so. And then we get a scene in the marketplace as Riker meets up with the Crushers who are on their way to the mall. They continue on through the mall and Riker mentions that he's noticed some strange things that are worth investigating. They all stop at a stall and Dr. Crusher is trying to dodge Riker's retorts dismissively. She looks down at a swatch of cloth. She sees the cloth is red and mentions under her breath that it would look great in gold. Finally getting annoyed, she turns to address Riker, still dismissing his claims about the strange happenings. Then she looks down at the cloth again and it basically turns gold in her hands. So she now listens to Riker and his report. And then she asks the man running the stall to send the cloth to the Enterprise when it arrives, and then to charge it to her account. This is one of many comments that leads to the massive debate about money and the UFP. Plus, this guy at the stall looks like someone I might have seen at a Grateful Dead concert in the days of my youth. Dr. Crusher apologizes to Riker, and Wesley Crusher points out that the cloth wasn't gold beforehand. She agrees that this might be something that John Luke would like looked into. Riker now piqued with interest at the mention of the captain's name, asks if she knows the captain. Wesley then goes on to explain that when he was little, Picard brought his father home to him when he had died in service to Starfleet. The Crushers then depart. From behind, Jordy LaForge enters and gives a statement to Riker, and then Riker dresses him down for not addressing him properly. This is probably the only time we see Starfleet behave in this manner. Jordy straightens up and continues to report that the Enterprise has arrived, but it's missing its saucer section, 
and that the captain is requesting Riker to beam up immediately. Riker comments that something must be wrong and that the captain wastes no time. He continues to walk away, but he doesn't even give Jordy a proper dismissal after making him jump through hoops to address him. Riker then calls up to the Enterprise and beams up. Act, Act 5, five. Starting off, we get a nice shot of the Enterprise in orbit of Deneb 4, without its saucer section. Riker beams in and meets Natasha Yar. He asks her some questions, but she retorts that the captain would better answer them. They take a turbo lift and head to the battle bridge. Riker and Yar enter the battle bridge. Riker then addresses himself, and Picard gives what could be considered the coldest Starfleet welcome ever. Picard barely looks at the man and treats him like he's waving away an annoying and overbearing house servant. Picard then orders Riker to catch up on the recent events with the viewscreen monitor. Riker then proceeds to watch the viewscreen. Picard heads to the ready room and data reports that the saucer section has arrived. Picard tells the crew to send Riker to him when he's done catching up. Riker finishes the video and gives what looks like, what the hell did I just step into? Then he heads off to meet Jean-Luc Picard. Riker then enters the ready room and mentions to Picard that this is not a run of the mill situation. Picard then agrees wholeheartedly and replies, we have been put on a serious probation. Data calls and mentions the saucer is now in orbit. Picard acknowledges and he says he will have Commander Riker do a manual docking. He then orders Riker out the door. Riker enters the bridge and begins the procedure. With the saucer now in sight, Riker commands the crew what to do. The Enterprise begins to ease in place and then Riker gives the command to lock. After the procedure, Riker heads to the conference lounge to meet with Picard. Picard asks him a few questions about his past service. Riker explains what he considers important and that a captain's life means more to him than a captain's order. Picard considers the answer and then asks Riker for a special favor. Picard replies, he's never been a family man and now Starfleet has posted him to a ship with families and children. He asks Riker for help with not making him look like a fool in front of children. Riker then agrees. They shake hands, and Picard now formally welcomes Riker to the Enterprise. Down in sickbay, we get a shot of Dr. Crusher examining Jordy LaForge. He goes on to explain to her about his condition, how his visor works, and that he always feels pain when he wears it. He continues to say that he can see all the electromagnetic spectrum of heat, radio, and other waves. Dr. Crusher then offers alternatives to Jordy's pain, but Jordy says that would interfere with the function of his visor, so he declines. Back on the main bridge, Riker enters and looks at it for the first time. He is taken back and awed as much as Picard was when Picard first entered the bridge. He asks Worf where Data is. Worf replies that he's on special assignment escorting an admiral by shuttle. He goes on to continue the admiral has been aboard all day and he's checking over the medical capabilities of the ship. Riker questions Worf, why wouldn't the admiral just beam over? Worf replies, the admiral is a remarkable man. And then we get our surprise special guest in all his glory. Admiral, Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy. Now 137 years old, McCoy walks down the hall and banters back and forth with Data. We see that Bones still has his teleporter phobia and is definitely set in his old ways. In many ways, I love this scene with Kelly. Not only was this a great send-off to an iconic character, but Kelly was the first of the original cast to pass away, and it doubles as a great send-off to an amazing actor as well. After some heartfelt conversation about Vulcans and their mannerisms, the Admiral then turns to Data and says, Well, this is a new ship, but she's got the right name. Now, you remember that, you hear? I will, sir. You treat her like a lady. And she'll always bring you home. And this concludes the first half of my two-part review of TNG series opener, The Encounter at Farpoint. I hope you all enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to stay informed for when I release part two. I will do my best to put out as much content as I can. After part two of this review, then we head on to Deep Space Nine series opener, Emissary, which due to length will be another two-part review. But DS9 is by far my absolute favorite Star Trek series and I can't wait. So until next time, and I seriously want to thank you all for watching because I know my videos are not short by any means, which means if you made it this far, you are a true champion.
And as always, if you like what I do, don't hesitate to subscribe for more content. Hit the like button or drop it in the discussions below. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the show.